Well, hello, hello, fam fam. Welcome back. Hey, hey, it's your girls, Carolina and Tessa. Oh, we love you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Today, we have a lovely, lovely guest who we are so excited that she was able to make time for us. She's been so busy as we all are, but today we have Miss Numa Perrier. She is a filmmaker, actress, visual artist, and if you have not seen her latest work, it is on Netflix, so very easy to come by. I saw her um, through the, I saw her work through Array Now, that is at Array Now on Instagram, which is a nonprofit organization that is focused on producing and amplifying black artists and filmmakers of color. Um, and so when I saw her film Jezebel featured on there, I went and watched it, loved it. And I thought that um, she had such a unique, specific voice. And I, I just loved how brave she was in her storytelling. So today you get to hear all about her as a filmmaker. And I think you guys will find a lot of things relatable to you as artists. And um, we really just love the scope she covered there um, as creators and, and it's in a storytelling. super inspirational so, episode, guys. You guys. Like, I know some of our episodes are, like, more technical and some are more, like, abstract or whatever. But, like, this one is very much about, like, being you and owning your story. And, it, like, we can't stress that enough, <laughs> you know? So, yeah. 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 I think you guys will enjoy it. I think you guys will be inspired. I know we were. Yes, we were. So enjoy Miss Numa. I wanted to let you know how we actually found you because I feel like there's some great things we can talk about just in that itself. And then we would love to hear more about your personal journey as a filmmaker, storyteller. Um, because Femregard, if, if you are a new listener to the show or new me yourself, we are here to educate independent filmmakers and to help them learn different roles of production. But also we're really passionate about amplifying diverse voices and women in the industry. And something that the way I found you was through Array Now's social Instagram account. Mm -hmm. And um, for those of you who are tuning in, Array Now is a nonprofit organization for producing, amplifying, and distributing work by Black artists and filmmakers of color. And so I found you on there and I went on to your little page. I was like, <laughs> okay, she's glamming, love it. And then I saw um, some of your work from uh, Jezebel, mm -hmm. your film, yeah. and I saw that it was... I was able to view it on Netflix, so I went over there, I watched it, I loved it, and then, you know, still thirsty for more, I found um, your website, um, your production company, House of Numa, yes. and yes, I, I just, wow, I was blown away by, well, I was actually trying to figure out what your role in that was, and I, because I could tell you were doing multiple things, and then I realized how personal, personal of a story it is. And um, just your role in it. And I just want to talk about that, too, because as a filmmaker and storyteller, being so raw is not easy to do. And I just saw your little uh, snippets of why you finally made the leap to doing that. And I just like love that so much and respect that so much. So, yeah, I want to delve into all those nitty gritty things. Okay. But that's how we found you. Yeah. <laughs> well, definitely shout out to Array um, and Ava DuVernay, her company. Uh, it's it's doing exactly what it's supposed to do, uh, which is amplifying voices like mine and artists like me. So I'm so happy that you found me through Array. And I'm so happy that my film is part of that family and I'm part of that family. So yeah, I think that, um, yeah, it's a great entry point for a lot of up and coming filmmakers. I love that. So fam, you got it. If you aren't tuning into it, you should, cause yeah, there's amazing work. Um, so new ever remind me, was Jezebel your first film? Cause that's what I thought I saw your fir big first uh, feature yeah. film. Yeah, uh, Jezebel is the first feature film that I directed. I had done a handful of short films prior to that. 
um, and a lot of web series content as a producer, director, <laughs> actress. I've really been on all sides of the camera, inside of the camera. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> projects before I did Jezebel, but it is my first feature film, and definitely I consider it, you know, an introduction to who I am, uh, what I stand for, my personal life as well, and um, what's important to me in terms of cinematic language. I just want to take a second to like, holy shit, your first feature is on Netflix. Like that's a big deal. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a huge accomplishment. I'm so happy. Again, it's another shout out to Array um, because they're my distributor and their connection is like a direct pipeline to Netflix, which That's is amazing. always where I wanted my film to land because it's uh, so abundant in terms of how many people have access to Netflix. It could still always be more, of course, but it's a really strong global presence that I that I always wanted for myself and for this film in particular. So you can, you know, watch it um, in your own home, on your mobile device, you know, all of those things, yeah. how I really wanted to reach people with my film. So it's really the perfect home. I love <laughs> Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and then like Array, I think that's yeah. super exciting. And it, it seems to me like it's going to be a name that people are really going to know soon because I wasn't aware of it before Carolina had pointed it out, but Ava DuVernay, like that name is everywhere right now. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, it's yeah. been, been here for a minute, you know, and I, yeah, and, um, you know, her reach is, is very global, and it's it's great that you're coming yeah. to it, and that there's, as the, as Array has built over the years, um, it's, yeah, just become more and more recognizable with a, you know, larger slate of films coming out, and, you know, very specifically curated, and a very specific mission that I think is really important, so, I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, and I, I think it's only going to yeah, get definitely. bigger. And I mean, it's it's kind of, I don't want to say the perfect time because like it's always been the perfect time, let's be real. But like at least kind of people's attention are on the issue of diversity right now, you know? So it's really a time when the people that weren't paying attention to that or weren't really aware of the disparity with it are now, you know? So it's it's a good time for everybody to be kind of realizing like, oh, wow, the importance of diverse voice, of diverse voices in storytelling and just like how important that is and how many diverse storytellers there are. And like, it just, it's waking people up. And I think that's, that's really great. Yeah, it's really great. And I, I think that um, the digital space, you know, in the last 10 years is really what opened that up more than anything else. I don't necessarily think it was from really anyone necessarily realizing it, but more that there's a space and there's an avenue for work, like even YouTube, you know, in the mm -hmm. early days. And now mm -hmm. still a lot of really talented people, you know, use YouTube, use TikTok, use all of these digital spaces to, um, reach people that they wouldn't have normally been able to reach. And those people themselves, that audience has also been ignored. So it's really, I feel the digital space that has opened that up and made creators like myself undeniable because, yeah. you know, that is now there's a metric for what we've always known was correct that our stories are important, that people want to know more about our lives and what's important to us um, as women, as Black women, yes. and you know, all of that. So that's, yes, I always yes. think that if the digital space didn't happen, then I don't, I don't really know if much would have changed or, you know, it's a much more rapid space. And for me, it's still too slow, but I think that it's that space that has really provided that. Yeah, totally makes sense. I love that how you say like, it makes us yeah. undeniable. Like that's such a cool way to like encapsulate that, but you're totally right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't ignore, you know, when someone has an audience or you're, you are you can't ignore, you mm -hmm. know, um, the, res the direct response from an audience is not something that can be ignored. And even if it is ignored, you as a creator can cultivate that audience and not even worry about who's ignoring you. 
So it's been, that's, yeah, that's really been, even us, you know, being able to have, <laughs> be, have this podcast flourish, all of that is because yeah. of the space that, that, yes. that we've all really leaned into and you know, found a way to innovate inside of it. And so, you know, that's some years behind us now, but it's only, we're only going to go deeper into that. And I think even Netflix is an example of that. So. Yeah, it's it. I love that you are lo- love partnering with Netflix. You know, we we aspire to one day, you know, be able to work with them too. So it's it's always good to hear that, you know, that your end goal is a mm-hmm. is a healthy one. You know, it's a good you know holistic approach, and they sound like they care about those things. Mm-hmm. So I love I love knowing that too, because you never know until you meet someone yeah. who's actually exactly in it. yeah. <laughs> well, I've always been a fan of uh, the way that company moves. Um, you know, now they're really more of a, they're more of a studio in a traditional sense than they've ever been. Um, but in the early days of Netflix, when the whole, when, when they were really, really disrupting this space and the idea, they are continuing to do so, but they have kind of moved more. You people have, they, they set the tone and now studios also have streamers, you know, they set this the tone mm. for streaming content, um, yes. streaming films and a new way of approaching and having accessibility to cinema as really they've led that charge, you know? <laughs> and so that was always <laughs> yeah. really exciting for me because I could see how that was a really rapid current that I mm. could get in and start mm. moving my project projects forward. And because I always feel impatient and like things don't, we get that, <laughs> you know, like I want to get more done. Yep. And now, you know, there's a, there's a avenue that has a certain current to it now. And um, yeah, I've always been a fan of their business model yeah. in that way. You know, the people that we've had on the show that have things on Netflix have had nothing but positive things to say about Netflix. So shout out to Netflix because you guys are doing it right. <laughs> It's all ad for Netflix. <laughs> yeah, it's true yes. I'm taking it back to what you were saying about, you know, the importance of, you know, sharing your stories in life. I was telling um, Tessa the way I would describe your film is a slice of life mm-hmm. type of film, similar to um, Nomadland, something where you really feel like you're in that world and at that specific time. Um, I've, um, I want to say it was like the 90s. Yeah, in 99, 90s? 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The 99, 2000. Um. Okay, I'm a 93 baby, so, you know, I, I remember. Exactly. Um. Um, 99, 2000s. <laughs> uh, yes, it's very much a slice of life, but all of my work has been, and even if I'm not writing mm. the script, I find a way to make it a slice of life. I have to find a personal entry point to express myself and to invite people into my world and you know my emotional landscape and mm. how my point of view on things and I'm very selfish in that way <laughs> in that you know I really am trying to purge. no as you should be yeah as I should be yes definitely I'm really trying to purge that thing mm. you know that comes up those feelings and um, yeah so from my very sh- first short film I was doing that. And it was really important to me in my first feature and, you know, telling the story of Jezebel that, yeah, raw was, you know, like the first word I probably wrote down was I wanted this to be raw and honest and inviting and sensual and, you know, all of the things that I feel (laughs) it is. I'm really, really proud of it. Um, But all of that starts from a personal place in me, you know, what I went through. And I know that's a story no one else could tell. Yeah, And that's like, I mean, that's one of the first things I think we learned about storytelling was like, people always say, you know, why is it you writing this story? Why is it you telling this story? And it has to be because you're the only one who can, you know, the only one who can tell it that way. So I think that's really important that you say that, yeah. Right. We're working on our first feature, which is a psychological thriller. Tell me more. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. It's set in the near future where we're all microchipped (laughs) Mm -hmm. and we can sync our minds to one another as a way to communicate and find Mm -hmm. like closeness and interaction because 
let's face it, we're all kind of zombies anyways on our phones walking around. But that's like, that's not, the technology isn't actually where I'm centering the full story. It's, it seems like it's going Black Mirror, but it's actually centered around human relationships mm. um, and female specific relationships. Mm-hmm. And I just, because I was like, wow, you know, cool, I can write about you know, this a psychological thriller in this cool sci-fi world. But what does that mean to me? Right. And I realize I'm someone who will always be a strong writer in like the things I've been went through, of course, in my own personal relationships and experiences. So I just it can be sometimes hard to like strip that apart from yourself to even like write down. But I think that's the best way to tell a story. You know, I I, ha- I do the same thing. Nima. I'm like, let's bring it back. What do I care about? What do I want to say? And and so, yes, the, the sci-fi world is just the setting, but and the technology is just the vessel for those it's it was it's centered around toxic relationships mm-hmm. and, and narcissism and and that kind of that those kinds of relationships well, I'm that I love it already and I couldn't agree more about you know, within that genre um and within any genre you know none of it is out of reach to us when you can find a personal mm-hmm. way in and for me it's also about mm-hmm. risk taking that the biggest risk is you know showing who you are letting yourself be exposed having that vulnerability in your work um and really just having skin in the game <laughs> and because it's such a long road to travel um, when you're making a film that it's got to cost you something for, mm. you, for you to see yeah. it through, you know? And so I, that wasn't necessarily what I was thinking exactly consciously the first time I made a film about my life, but in kind of unpacking it, I realized that that's really a driver for me. It's a little bit of that thrill of taking the risk, you know, that thrill of jumping yeah. um, is exciting and that propels you through at least <laughs> <Yeah>. production, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then, um, you know, it's really a propelling force to feel like you're putting your heart out there um, for the world to criticize, step on or embrace. Yeah. And it's so important because it's like, (laughs) yeah, Yeah, we're both like, yeah, Yeah. no, but like, really, really. yeah, I feel that as a writer and a storyteller of like, you know, if something's your baby, you're like, well, am I ready to put that out in the world? Like, especially if it's your first film, you're like, we're going to fuck it up. Like, but like you said, you have to have skin in the game because otherwise it's not going to mean anything. You're not going to have a good time. Like, it's not going to be important for you to finish it and to tell that story if it doesn't mean something to you. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, there's the argument of like, do you hold on to your baby babies and maybe start with something a little, you know, who, whatever works for you. I think everyone's different, but I think it is important that it means something to you. And it's a story that you have to tell because otherwise, why are you wasting your time? Production is hard. Like, <laughs> Yeah. It's a, it's a long road full of all types of hiccups and surprises and, accidents sometimes happy sometimes disastrous <laughs> you know and you definitely um you definitely want to be in a space where you care enough to see all of that through um and you know that doesn't mean that it has to be pulling up trauma um but it, even in the most lighthearted <laughs> why not <laughs> it can still be personal to you and cost you something, you know, and that's what makes it worth Mm -hmm. it for me. You know, um, everyone has a different approach, but that's definitely, Mm -hmm. I really realize that that's been a definite propelling force. Yeah, totally. Um, and I, I'd like to talk a little bit more, um, about like the specifics of Netflix since we brought that up. I know there's probably filmmakers listening that are like, well, how do I get on Netflix? Um, so I'm curious, the process for you, was it something that like you had already had the film finished and then like took it to Netflix to sell to them? Or was it something you had talked to them in pre-production and they were a part of the filmmaking process? Like, how did that all work for you? 
Uh, the film was made completely independently uh, through my company, House of Numa. Um, you know, under six figure budget, <laughs> very micro budget film. So Netflix had nothing to do with that. This I don't even know if this was a story that I that I I don't know. I don't know. I just knew that. I had to make it on my own. I didn't want to take the time of going and pitching it everywhere and having people tell me how it was going to go because I already knew that no one had the right to do that for the story and I needed to just figure it out. And I had done so much already. You know, I didn't feel like I want to prove that I'm cap capable, nothing, you know, I'm going to yeah. do this. So I did it. I made the film. I went through a year of post-production because it is a micro budget indie. I was raising money throughout that mm -hmm. whole year <laughs> um, just to finish, to be able to pay people and, and finish. Um, and then I went the festival route, submitting, submitting, submitting. We landed at South by Southwest um, the year before the pandemic. <laughs> so it was just really the timing of wow. it, you know, landing at a really high profile festival, got the attention of pretty much everybody <laughs> um, who <laughs> cared, <laughs> um, who cared about me, who cared about what I was doing next, who knew some of my work from before um, and my team, uh, you know, my agents and everything. I did all of this without them, you know, because this wasn't, you, you know, in, in their trajectory, it would be take it, pitch it. I just, I was so tired of waiting to make a feature and it was a strategic career move for me that I felt, and this isn't for everyone, but for me, what I had seen and other filmmakers I admired, uh, their, you know, their trajectory was that everything seemed to move once they made their feature. And once they really put their signature out there that showed who they were and and really introduce themselves in a real way. So I almost looked at it as mm -hmm. ritual. <laughs> so I'm gonna make my first film mm -hmm. and then people are gonna finally really know what I can do, you know? And so did the festivals um, and through that, my sales rep sent the film to Array and Array distributed the film. That's how it's okay. on Netflix. <laughs> So those are the steps, you know. Um, I love it. I know. Yeah. Lay it all know, out. You see the final result and you're like, oh, this film is on Netflix. I think a lot of times the assumption is, oh, Netflix paid for mm -hmm. this movie, you know, or whatever. If you watch my no, film, sure. it's very clearly a micro budget. They did not, mm -hmm. you know, pay for the film. Um, but they are, they are, uh, it is on their platform and it will be there for some time and it's yeah. great, but yeah, it's really this, you know, one step at a time, very indie route. I love that, yeah. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Fafalius, and I'm the producer of Krista Makes a Podcast and the host of the One Hit Thunder Podcast. And I'm Matt Kelly, host of Horror Movie Night and the producer slash the head of content for the Geekscape Podcasting Network. Between the two of us, we have, believe it or not, 25 years of podcasting experience, and we want to help you start your own podcast. We know podcasting and we want to share that knowledge with you. So whether you're new to podcasting or you want some feedback on your currently active podcast, we want to help. Or perhaps you're just overwhelmed with all of the editing work. Well, we can help you with that also. You can contact us at info at we know podcasting.com for more information. We're excited to help your podcasting dreams become a reality. I love that. <laughs> I love that because it is it is what we're doing. Like even in our last short film that's out right now, Desert Flowers, watch it all. Um, it's it took us two years to like just learn how to do proper post production and then you know finalize it. So it makes complete sense that you know this isn't something that just happened overnight for you and oh, and sure. we landed on Netflix. No, um, no. but it is doable. It is yeah. so doable. It just, you guys got to, you know, be patient and, and do the things in order to get there. It'll, it'll happen. And also you know, Netflix, Netflix is programming short films now too. So I always kind of hesitate what? when I tell that story that a feature film was really important for me because it, it is, and it was, but it's not the only way um, to land on Netflix. And it's not the only way to start your career. People are making short films and then those short films are becoming TV series or becoming films, you know, there's different ways, you know, for me, for it sure. was all about making a feature. It was all about, 
uh, showing my endurance and showing the control of my craft and showing a, you know, a full story that a whole theater could pack into and, you know, yes. and, and sit and enjoy in that way and, and, you know, be able to have it as more of a commodity. Um, so I was thinking with a lot of different hats on from I mean, business production, my own career, what I had done up to that date, you know, which was yeah. already so many short films, already so much short form content on YouTube um, that, yeah, it was time. It was time for me. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I, I think that's so smart. And that's kind of what we're thinking too. We are starting with this next, this next, it's our first feature at a micro budget level. And again, like, I love that you said you're thinking business minded too. Like for us, it's, if we want to get more money in the future, we have to show investors what we've done, not on a short films like budget and scale, but what we could do on on a full feature mm -hmm. film. So that way they can mm -hmm. build trust and, you know, rapport there as well, that we know how to handle yeah that full production. And even if it's at a small budget, um, I think that's a good step forward for us to like show our strengths. Yeah. But it's like, <laughs> it's a lot. It is a puzzle. Is a puzzle. Sure, you know, and yeah, again, for me, it was also really about um, introducing myself, people to know, to know me, because a lot of it is about just you as a person, you know, they want to hire yeah. you. They want to give you yeah. money. <laughs> they want to be part yeah. of your career. They want to be a part of what's going to happen next for you. That type of thing. Girl, we forget but, yeah, that sometimes. Like they don't We're so you. worried about all those things. Yeah. yeah. And, but, you know, for, for me, there was no better way to introduce myself to the world than through the story of Jezebel, yeah. you know? No, <laughs> for like sure. It's all there, you know? It's really all there. You can really get to know who I am through that film. And uh, yeah, that was that was important to me, that personal Yeah, component. I think that's a really great way. Like, so Carolina and I started out as actors before we were filmmakers too. So I feel like as an actor, mm -hmm. you're always told like, you know, don't put so much stress on the audition, you're booking the room. Like they want to see you like, you know, and as a storyteller and a filmmaker, sometimes we forget that because it feels less personal. But like, even if you're telling a story that isn't, you know, based on your true life or whatever, it's still your story. Again, it goes back to like, why are you telling this story? Even if it's, you know, if I'm writing a story yeah. about a 40 year old man or whatever, like there's some reason it's coming from something inside of me. So when you're pitching yeah. that to people or you're coming to investors or, you know, whatever, like they are seeing your way of storytelling you know so like you said it's like they're hiring you for you they're hiring you for the kinds of stories you tell and the way that you tell them and I think that's yeah that's really important to remember because sometimes it feels very impersonal yeah, yeah it, you do have to kind of constantly remind yourself <laughs> but you know um it, it's it's very it's a very true thing that you see and, and if you really look at the people that have supported you over the years in whatever capacity um you will probably see that link like oh okay <laughs> we actually really enjoy being around each other or you know, they really <laughs> saw something in me early that i hadn't really stepped into for myself mm. totally or whatever it is mm. there's always kind of that piece of inspiration that is going back and forth between whoever's supporting you um, and that is something that you, you can't buy, <laughs> you can only, you know, be open to it and keep expressing yourself to see what comes back to you in, in that yeah. form. I also, I love, uh, filmmakers that like, you can tell when a movie is their movie, even if their stuff is all different. Like the Coen brothers is a great example to me because it's like, they do so many different genres. Like some movies are borderline serious. Some are just hilarious. They've done Westerns. They've mm -hmm. done like every kind of movie you can think of, mm -hmm. but you can always tell when it's a Coen brothers movie, you know? And it's like, you, you're like, yeah. wait, is it the dialogue? <laughs> I aspire yeah. to that. Cause I want to do all the genres. I want to yeah. do everything. I want to do all the genres. But you still yes. know that new, this is Numa's film. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I, I feel mm -hmm. this, you know, but so it's like you have a signature 
that yeah. that plays across all different types of worlds. You know, I don't only want to be in one mm -hmm. world of filmmaking. I want to explore. I want to go a lot of different places. Um, but always, you always have that mark yeah. on it. You know, the Numa that, that Numa mark. You know, so yes. yeah, I feel that. Do you feel like you're um, after doing Jezebel that you've really? And I would say you do, you do you have at least a very firm foundation of what your Numa mark is or D and I, I feel like everyone's going to keep exploring themselves. Otherwise, you know, we could just die tomorrow <laughs> in our work. Right. But what, yeah. Where do you, do you feel like you've now in your career really honed that? I wouldn't say it's honed. I do think I'm still exploring it. Um, but I do think that there are certain things that, it, you know, if you were to like list filmmakers and show these images from the film or even you know just yeah. play some of the audio that more often than not people would be able to point me out if they know my work or get pretty close you know I would be like in their top two or three choices like this is probably Numa or this you know something <laughs> like that um but I think you know that that's just going to grow and become more more obvious um as I figure it out too you know I just yeah I came off of doing a big rom-com for Netflix um and I'm in post on that right now I'm in like the second week of my director's cut and I'm starting to feel I think it's um about a certain rhythm that I have that I can that that is very present in Jezebel I feel like it is being applied to this film um a certain rhythm a certain um keeping the performances really under the belt, pu pulling things back, letting it breathe. Those, those are certain, those are certain things that I gravitate towards and that I like to see and I like to feel. I feel like it augments the emotion in a scene when you do that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think those are some characteristics, you know, <laughs> yeah, I would for sure. no matter what, no matter what I'm doing, but. I, that's so like exciting to, yeah. to discover that because it's something that you wouldn't yeah. know until you start creating, you know, like until you start seeing those yeah. results. You'd have to yeah. see a pattern, right? So it's like, we, right. so that's why it's important that we have more opportunities to make mm -hmm. more films because that's how you kind of develop your own canon. That's how you make a stronger contribution to, you know, the, the volume that's already out there. And, you know, just for yourself, like you can't really name a pattern until you have a succession of things, you know? So, yeah. But I think if you were to reach back yeah. to my short films, you would see how those led to Jezebel. You would see my work in the digital space. You would see how that, you know, it makes- Yeah, because it all adds up. Yeah, it, it all, all like up. starts to multiply. Yeah. And then you start to like, yes, like you said, find your patterns. Because that's such a great way of looking at it. Sometimes- you know, if anyone out there is like, I just don't know, like, what my voice is, like, eventually it'll hit and you'll be like, oh, wait, I get why I made that weird yep. film yep. back in yep. <laughs> 2015 mm -hmm. that was like, seemed really irrelevant to my work today. But no, there's a piece of it there, you know, like, and and you should you should pay attention to those things um, because there's a reason why we are, we make things. Mm -hmm. It's coming from somewhere, somewhere in our subconscious. And I, I love being really introspective <laughs> like that. I love it. <laughs> and it applies to every artist, you know, it, it applies it to, to sculpting. It applies to recording artists mm -hmm. and musicians. And, you know, as you build and as you travel through, I mean, hell, it probably like applies to <laughs> people that work with cars. I mean, those yeah. are artists too, people who design cars even, you know, there's, there's <laughs> yeah. a reason and there's a way and there's a journey and you can, you can always, you know, kind of look back as you get some of that behind you. So, yeah. Who are some of your favorite um, filmmakers that you like to, that you enjoy and, and that really have inspired your work? I, a lot of my inspiration comes from artists in the visual space who sometimes make films, you know, some, they, sometimes they call themselves filmmakers, sometimes not, um, or visual that. artists that have yet to make a film that I would love to see them make a <laughs> film because I come from that space, you know, um, of, you know, experimental filmmaking, video art, um, yeah. and installation work as a visual artist. So, you know, like Carrie Mae Weems is someone who I always love. 
um, from her, or she has, you know, early films that they call, they're, they call video art or films, I'm not sure with her, but her early photography, um, all of the installation work that she does. Um, Micheline is another filmmaker, visual artist who I love, uh, very personal work, um, is always kind of like unpacking things uh, with their mm -hmm. mother, very interesting. Um, Louise Bourgeois, uh, is, is an artist who I don't think, I don't, I'm not aware of any film works of hers, but very detailed, large scale installations that take, that really create a world. Uh, I just, that those are the people, you know, and in, in, in that space yeah. that I really pull from. And then I'm translating some of those ideas or approach to the work in a film. So like a I very deep, immersive dive mm -hmm. into these spaces and imagination. Um, I love to see that in film form. Nice. No, that's so cool. I like right now, just for me, um, she's not like a filmmaker, but I'm like, man, I would love to work with her as a director. Um, is Kali Uchis, the singer. Mm -hmm. Her like music videos, she's got that femme fatale thing that I love. That little, like that, that which I can see in our, in another film that we have that we're, we're developing. And I just like, it's it's cool. You can, I love that you found it through art or through people that aren't mm -hmm. typical filmmakers that you want to see. I think that's something you've kept repeating over this interview is that you love, um, you really find things that you enjoy, that you visually, and I think we we sometimes get wrapped up. Oh, what's like, what sell? is it gonna? Yeah. What's gonna be popular? Yeah, what's gonna yeah. sell? What's gonna be popular in the mainstream? But at the end of the day, it's like it's also for you to enjoy it. Chances are, there's gonna be someone else who really enjoys that too. Yeah, please yourself. I mean, that's uh, <laughs> that is, uh, <laughs> like a number one. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, what did the, some quite you know, take your pleasure seriously. I think that goes across mm -hmm. the board, you know, whether that's, you know, in your sex life or in your filmmaking, <laughs> you know, take your pleasure Facts. seriously. <laughs> you should be delighted, you know, when, you, when you're uh, going through your edit and looking at your footage, when you're on set, you should be feeling like mm -hmm. waves of pleasure. You should be feeling yes. good. And it should be what you, it should be what you like, and that's kind of the first and maybe main ingredient to what your voice is. You know, what do you like? Yeah, I mean, like you mm -hmm. said, that should apply like, to everything fine. in your life. First of all, yeah, it really should. Yeah, I think that's just a standard that it's it's important. You know, and that's actually an interesting thing to think about in terms of you know being a woman, being a filmmaker. Um, being an artist and being kind of conditioned to maybe put other people's pleasure ahead of yours. Um, it's mm -hmm. not something you want trickling into your art. So it's, <laughs> you know, it, you, you yeah. really do have to please yourself first and then in, invite people to enjoy yeah. that. And honestly, <laughs> yes, yes. Your amen. Amen. <laughs> Sorry, I just need it, needed to like put that I mean I, I, mean, just, I just like I uh, I have no um I don't really have any wiggle room mm -hmm. around that you know and <laughs> so yeah honestly important. that yeah. like even from the business mind too is probably gonna sell better because you've got proof that you enjoy this if you're just making shit that you mm -hmm. think other people are going to enjoy, you don't even know for sure if they do. You're just guessing. If you yeah. know you enjoy it, yeah. you know at least somebody is going to enjoy it. Like somebody is going to think the same way you right. do. You know, it's it's like it's proof already. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And if you're doing it that way also, you're, and let's say you are, you're kind of, you know, rolling the dice. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But also what I think is a little more scary is if you do hit it and it is something that someone likes and you, because you were kind of trying to think of things that people might like, then you're probably in the derivative mm -hmm. space, you know? And to me, that's like, yeah. oh, that's worse, you know? <laughs> so, you know, yeah, please yourself first, <laughs> know thyself. <laughs> yes. I think, I think you both touched on, cause I think there could be a fear that maybe no one would like this. That's the other spectrum of it. It's like, oh, I don't, I don't know. But 
I think we got to just do it. Yeah. Just this, do you. You would never be alone. <laughs> I don't think any of us are ever alone in thought or in pattern. So that's why when mm. sometimes you're thinking of something, you know, it's, it's the zeitgeist, you know? So you're thinking of something and you're like, oh shit, someone did that. Or, yeah. some, you know, like yeah, yeah, always, yeah. you know, propelling and kind of uh, accumulating, you know, all, all together, you know, that, that energy is, is real and it's a current. And so- if it's you, there's going to be multiples yeah. of that. So, yeah. And so the more plugged in you are, the more you're going to receive whoever mm-hmm. else, you know, <laughs> whoever yeah. else it is. There's too many people in the world that you, you wouldn't be alone in something that yeah. you like. Yeah, I think that's so important. It's It's something that like, as I've gotten older and like more mature, I'm realizing more and more is like, we think we're so alone in our thoughts and feelings sometimes and like we compare ourselves to others so much or like compare our traumas to others, which is like, so it's, don't do that. (laughs) But like, we don't realize how much we relate to other people and how much we all experience the same things. And it's like, like the show Pen15, I don't know if you've watched that Numa, but it's, yeah. So like Mm -hmm. they have so many experiences as like junior high kids you know that the writers were saying because the the two main actresses are also the writers they were saying like they were afraid to like bring some of these things up because they're like wait were we the only ones that went through this and that show is so relatable (laughs) because it's the stuff that exactly and like we didn't necessarily (laughs) talk about either so it's like oh my god somebody else Uh, did do that like you know (laughs) those are the best those are the best ones the one that you really feel the most the one that costs mm-hmm. you the most, you know, the one that you're just mm-hmm. like, oh my God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the one. That's the one you should be yes. doing, you know. Like yep. that's the one that has us all smiling right now. <laughs> you know, that's the, that's where you want to be in your work. And you know, that's I mean, that's just where the mm-hmm. gold is. Yes, I absolutely agree. <laughs> oh. Skin in the game, girls. I know. It just like because it, it's hard to do, but you you just I love that um, when I was researching you that you said it's just something you couldn't ignore after a while that you had to tell this story. Yeah. So guys, if you're listening to it, I think we all have that story in the back of our heads that we know we need to tell, and we just just like oh, just rip the bandaid <laughs> off and tell it. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Very yeah. Important. Yes. Well, Nima, this has been super inspiring. I love your approach to storytelling. Like, I think it's, I mean, okay, there's no right or wrong, or whatever, but like, I think it's such the, like the correct way to think about it is like, be yourself, mm-hmm. draw from your own experiences. Don't be afraid to talk about it. Cause every, like somebody's going to relate. Like, it's just, yeah, it's such a personal approach. Yeah. And I think that's so great. And I love it. <laughs> so and your yeah. style is so dope. I like love it. You. you you definitely do have such a strong, cool, um, visual medium, which discovering through talking to you totally makes sense why you you definitely have found your your groove with it. So we we loved everything today. I think it's been such an yeah. inspiring. And episode. I want our listeners to be able <laughs> yeah. to find you. I mean, obviously we know Jezebel's on Netflix. Um, but if they want to find like maybe some of your older work or just learn more about you, connect with you, maybe via social media, all that kind of stuff. If you want to share that information. Yes. You can, <laughs> Pimp it find, out, <laughs> you can find me at house of Numa. Welcome to my house, house of Numa.com. And then I'm on Twitter and Instagram at miss Numa. So I'm there. Come say hi. Awesome. Yay! Yes, fam, <laughs> fam, fam, say hi. And Numa, thank you. Thank you for enlightening us today. And we just can't wait to follow your work. You, I, you just wrapped up. I know you have more things coming out. I think I saw a horror film. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what we, got? we got something in the works. No, I love, yeah. I love that you're covering all the genres. That's so exciting and inspiring because that's well, what I want to do Thank you too. for inviting me. So. I'm glad we can make this happen. And definitely big hello to everyone out there awesome. listening. Oh, thank you. This was fun for me too. Like, I'm just, yeah, so happy to meet both of you. I want to know more about your films. Uh, send me your... Um, your purple website. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to FemRegard Podcast. If you like what you hear, tune in every Friday for more tips on the filmmaking business and insightful conversations with industry professionals. We can only grow with your support, so please subscribe, share, rate, and review. 
You can also join the Fem Fam on Patreon. For more on us, check us out at femregard.com. You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 